The street was blocked off. The horses were running skittish. The I'm cell phone cameras sure. were everywhere. I can't even see the bear. And the net was pulled taut. I've never seen anything like this. A black bear, way up high, flailing about after having a tranquilizer delivered to his derriere. They're trying to get it down from the tree. But that first dose didn't quite do the job. So wildlife officials took aim again and... Meanwhile, down below, the event was attracting the entire neighborhood, including Lori and company. Well, the girls, Lily, Nellie, and Millie. Three pygmy goats, territorial pygmy goats, who were none too pleased that a bear was moving in on their turf and were ready to do something about it. I feel safer with the goats here. I would too, because they will defend us, definitely. As he dozed off to La La Land, seven-year-old Annika came up with a name for him. Boots. <laughs> Why would you name him Boots? Because a lot of Boots are black. Pretty soon, Boots was sleeping just as hard as Annika's little sister. So hard, he dozed off, stuck in the tree. Fire department's on the way. And soon enough, there was BAFD, rolling in the big ladder truck and chainsaw in a clear path to Boots. But it's one thing to rescue a cat from a tree, let alone a 120-pound bear. What if he tries to eat them on the way down? We'll probably just run away. Finally, after firefighters had cleared the way, it was go time for wildlife officials as they gingerly, delicately, ever so cautiously tried to get boots out of the tree. We're talking in hushed tones. Well, I'm not sure we'd want to wake him up. <laughs> I don't know. And then, with one great heave, success. And soon, boots was back on the ground, groggy but safe. A pretty cool ending to a pretty cool day. It is pretty cool. It began just before noon with a call to police of a man out on a bridge. He was in an agitated state, just continually pacing but not speaking to anybody. Authorities would spend the next several hours trying to get through to him. As afternoon came, so too did friends and family who recognized him on the news. I can't see which way his head's looking. Now, he, yeah, he's looking this way. I know, he knows I'm here. This woman, fighting back tears, pleaded with him from afar to get down. Basically, my kids grew up with him. He grew up at my house. I'm here. Do you see me? Do you see me? As for what everyone else saw, the massive fallout from the situation with a portion of 244 looking like a ghost town for eight hours. I don't know how much longer he can be up there. Crouched down with a perfect view, Hannah Philbeck, who came to see the spectacle. What is he saying? Um, he's been screaming about water and then, because nobody's been giving him any water, and then he was talking about how they were trying to take away his freedom and he would rather die before somebody took away his freedom. Finally, at 8.15, a safe resolution as the man was grabbed by police when he came close to the edge, later strapped to a gurney and taken to an ambulance. This is another example in the city of Tulsa where we take mental health as a, a, a real serious, uh, it's, a, it's a real serious concern for us. We have some of the best negotiators in the country here and, uh, you know, they worked for, you know, eight and a half hours tonight to uh, to take the most measured approach and guarantee that we could get him to come to us, we could take him into custody safely, and that we didn't press the issue with him and potentially have a tragedy. The state capitol inspires awe, but there's concern a new monument would make the area Awful. Devil here, yeah, it looks like a devil. A seven foot tall statue of Satan, proposed by Satanists as a rebuttal to the placing of the Ten Commandments in 2012. The public's general response? Absolutely uh, not. A sentiment shared by Oklahoma State Senator Rick Brinkley. It's never going to happen. There will never be a monument to Satan on our Capitol grounds. It's not part of our culture. It's not part of our history. It's those two things, culture and history, argue lawmakers, that differentiate and allow the Ten Commandments. There is no way that a satanic monument designed with a seat in it for children to come and stare at the eyes of a goat-headed deity uh, has any relative relationship to the history or culture of this state. Which brings us to another group that takes exception to this statue. No! Goat lovers. They do something to the soul. They, they really calm you down. The Hagers have been raising goats since the 90s and scoff at the use of such a gentle creature for something so devilish. It, it angers me. It angers me very much because I believe as a goat herder, my, my, one of my jobs is to promote the goat. And then when I see, you know, the statue with a goat 
goat head representing. We interrupt this news story due to unruly, although not unholy, goat behavior. The microphone cable became an appetizer. Where were we? Oh, yes. Goats as a symbol of evil? There isn't anything evil about a goat. Nothing. A statue crumbling before its creation with poor choice and a mascot, and Christians celebrating victory just from the debate. If it does anything for the Christian people out there, it makes us realize that there are people, if they do worship Satan, that they acknowledge that our God exists. Bert Mumolo, Tulsa's Channel 8. Old glory was battered but still hanging on as 76-year-old Jack Wilkerson surveyed the damage to his house. I'm getting too old for this. He was home when the tornado struck without warning. It just came in out of nowhere. <laughs> the suddenness took Flo and Edna May by surprise as well, two of several hound dogs that took off running when the twister hit their yard. And there was one down on a lady's porch, and it was this one, Flo, and she said, I'm not moving. I found a porch. There's nothing blowing on me, and she wouldn't move for two hours either. They were in shock. That feeling of being in shock is something Chaplain Bunny Yexaman helps people deal with in the aftermath. They see the word chaplain and they just put their arms around me. And a lot of times it's just to listen and let them kind of talk through their storm story. The whole neighborhood is just... Those loss of words belong to Glenn Rice, who came back to town to see the house he grew up in and to send pictures to his brother. I know he's going to be disappointed. Meanwhile, back at Mr. Wilkerson's, Hello. his phone has been ringing nonstop with folks from far and wide checking up on him. Friends, neighbors, people I went to school with, everything. He can tell them about the house that gives new meaning to the phrase, everything but the kitchen sink or the sheet metal draped on a limb like a towel hanging out to dry, or the tools perfectly in position in the garage that's somehow still standing. And then there's the newly installed paneling. Got a piece of paneling on the side over there that the wind slammed it in so hard it drove the nails into the side of the house. Scenes of the surreal at every turn, making the sight of a new day the most surreal of all. People kept coming out and go, we're okay, we're okay, and I go, then everything's okay. This old house can be built back again, but I just got one lot. And I ain't got much of it left, as old as I am, so I want every day I can get. From the outside, the images of Veterans Day are genteel and calm. I think I'll have a scone. Of breakfasts and speeches and polite small talk. I was three years World War II. But on the inside of all those gray-haired soldiers, the images are anything but. No! Fury. I, I'm, I'm going to see that. I'm, I'm anxious to see it. For Bob Heatley, the film that features Brad Pitt as a tank commander bears a striking resemblance to his own role during the war. I was a platoon sergeant of a five-tank platoon. It was a job saturated with danger and death, about which the crews kept silent. We didn't think about it. But I know this, we had 85% casualties in my unit, and about half of that were deaths. Seventy years later, he still relives some of those experiences. If I get to thinking about it, I get kind of uptight a little bit. But that is a rarity. One nation under God. Because uptight is not a word okay. you associate with Bob. I'm going to blow it in your ear here now. When he wasn't announcing mealtime on his trumpet, <laughs> he was helping a fellow resident get situated. And he just screwed up a little more. Yes. Yeah, how's that? Asking our film crew to sit down and eat. You, hi, you'll want to have breakfast with us. And keeping up to date with the latest health trends. You know, I hear bacon is good for diabetes. Really? I, I read that. A civilian life a world away from World mm -hmm. War. And while those images may still be fresh to Bob, the title of that movie is a quality he made a conscious effort to leave on the battlefield when the war was done. I made a turn in my life that I was going to try to be friendly and nice to people and put that other behind me. And I think, I think that works. He ended the event with a moving rendition of Taps.
and ended our interview in typical Bob fashion. You're about ready to cut that thing off. <laughs> Bert Mumolo. <laughs> and unwire me. <laughs> Tells us Channel 8. I don't know. I